My name is Luke. I'm the curate here at Ascension, and it's really good to be at church with you today. Welcome if you're tuning in online. Welcome to you in the building. Now, the trouble with the book of Acts is that right at the beginning, the main character disappears. And it's a little bit awkward in that way. We've just read it. Jesus disappears. He departs from his friends. He's taken up into heaven in a cloud. The main character disappears. However, the main character remains the main character and the main actor throughout the book. Not by his bodily presence in the action, but by his spirit, his spirit or breath. And in this way, the book of Acts is so important because it tells us what our lives are like today. Jesus has disappeared, but he is still the main character, present and active by breathing on us like a wind pushing along a sailboat. Jesus' Holy Spirit is, or can be if we let it, the thing that powers us. Today we are starting a new ser sermon series on Sundays on the book of Acts, and I would like to begin this series and uh, begin our 2023 as a church by emphasizing this point. Let the Holy Spirit be what powers you. Let the Holy Spirit be what powers you. Because this is, after all, what makes us followers of Jesus unique. This is our trump card. In every other way of life, in every other philosophy, in every other culture, it's pretty much a given that the main character in any person's life is none other than the person whose life it is. You are you, after all, which means you are the main thing going on for you. Your desires, your motivations, your actions, your choices, these are the things that concern you most, and these are the things that power you. You are, of course, your main character. But Christians are strange beasts, because if you're a Christian, that's not the case. You are not the main character of your life. The main character in a Christian's life is the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus Christ in us and around us, powering us, which is slightly nerve-wracking, I think. The Holy Spirit is your main character. At the beginning of any book or a film or a TV series, the first thing that a main character says is all important. The, uh, the credits roll, the film begins, and everyone waits with bated breath for the delivery of that first line so that we can learn something essential about who this main character is. Let me give you a couple of examples. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a gangster. Which film is that? Goodfellas. Well done. Henry Hill in Goodfellas. Hello, my name's Forrest. Forrest Gump. You want a chocolate? Which film is that? Star Wars Episode Two: Return of the... Si Sorry, what? Forrest Gump. Oh, okay. Yes, Forrest Gump. You get the point. The first line is all important. It tells you something about that character. Now, the book of Acts is, uh, is like season two, as it were, of a single series written by one author, Luke. Luke tells us this right at the beginning of Acts. We just read it in verse one. In my former book, Theophilus, and by the way, we don't know who Theophilus was, unfortunately. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach. And by my former book, he is referring to the gospel of Luke. So here we are at the beginning of season two of the two-season drama of Luke and Acts. And as we commence season two, it's extra important that we pay close attention to the first words of Jesus, the main character, because they're not just his first words, they're also his last words. We have just overheard 
Jesus' final conversation with his friends before he departs from them. So let's just read it again uh, from verse 3. After his suffering, he presented himself to them and gave many convincing proofs that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days and spoke about the kingdom of God. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Here we go. Jesus' first words and last. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And then he continues in verse 7. It is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. These are the first and last words of Jesus. And they are simple. He asks his friends to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. This is who Jesus is. The main character. Our main character. This is who he is. He is the one who asks us to wait for the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, confusingly, you might be remembering that in Jesus' last words at the end of the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus tells his friends to go, to go and make disciples of all nations, which is odd because surely going is the opposite of waiting. Well, I think we need both here. Jesus' last words in Acts definitely have that sense of, of mission and action, of going. Jesus says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So clearly Jesus does want his followers to go and to act and to spread. But it's also really clear here in Acts that any going must first arise from waiting. Going comes out from waiting. And God isn't in a rush. That's one thing that the Bible makes extremely clear. Um, Here's my Bible. If God were in a rush, then Jesus would come about here. Whereas actually Jesus comes about, where is it? About here in our Bibles. God is not in a rush. God is the creator of time, he takes time, he takes time seriously, and God chooses to take time to work out his purposes in the world. And so we hear Jesus telling his followers to wait, and he says, it is not for you to know how long for. You don't know how long you're going to be waiting for. And we see this also at the end of season one, as it were, at the end of the Gospel of Luke in chapter 24, Jesus says, I'm going to send you what my Father has promised, i.e. the Holy Spirit, but stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high. In other words, don't do a single thing without the Holy Spirit. Wait, stay, wait for the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you'll be running off the wrong power source. Uh, Having had a chance to reflect a bit with Marcus, our vicar, I know that he would like Jesus' final agenda of waiting for the promised power of the Holy Spirit to be our agenda as individuals and as a church in 2023. Last week, I uh, talked a little bit about our job as Jesus' apprentices. Well, this is where it starts. You don't walk into an apprenticeship as, say, a woodworker and just start fiddling with bits of machinery or cutting this bit of wood or having a bit of an experiment with the sander. No, that would be a disaster. You wait and you watch and you listen for your teacher to show you the way. This is the case even more so in our job, in our job as Jesus' apprentices. Our job begins with waiting for him who's not only our teacher, but also our power, the main character in our lives. 
Um, I thought it would be good to get some scholarly input on this here at the beginning of a new series on a new book. So um, here's a prolific New Testament scholar called Beverly Roberts Gaventa. I've got a picture of her, I think. There she is, standing in front of lots of books, so you know what she's saying is serious. And uh, she has uh, spent a long time studying in depth the Gospel of Luke and Acts, kind of as one, because they're by the same author. And she says this about who Luke, the author, understands to be the main character in all of this. So she says this, and the quote will come up on the slide. When Luke shows human beings taking the initiative, that human initiative frequently has a negative function, usually in opposition to the gospel. There is for Luke a role for human responsibility, but that responsibility consists of aligning oneself with God's own initiatives. It is the responsibility to be obedient to God. Not responsibility in the sense of responsibility for planning events or deciding on strategies. Well, thank you, Beverly. Now, imagine if when Jesus ascended into heaven at the beginning of Acts, imagine if his friends had run headlong into planning and strategizing for Jesus. It would have been a disaster. Maybe we wouldn't even be here today. It would have been disastrous. Thankfully, instead, they were obedient to Jesus. They waited. They waited, recognizing that they would need God's initiative, God's gift of the power of the Holy Spirit, before they could even think about going and doing anything. Now, there will be, there will be times to go. There will be go times when it's clear that the Holy Spirit is prompting and powering us for a particular task. In the life of our church, think of how Bubble Church took off from 2020. Think of how our Wednesday morning drop-ins for people who are refugees has emerged over the past year or so. That, I believe, has been the power of the Holy Spirit. But as well as the go times, there will also be slow times. Slow times when the Spirit invites us simply to wait. And if we're just constantly in go mode, rushing and doing stuff and thinking, oh, what should we do next? While the Spirit is actually inviting us into slow time, then we will be out of step with God. Here at Ascension, uh, we have tried and we want to try even more to build slow times into our rhythms of life and worship. Uh, one example of, of a slow time that we've been experimenting with, you may have noticed over the past few months here at our 10.30 services, near the end of the service, we give about seven to ten minutes generally to a kind of open space of praying and worshipping and this is us trying to build slow time into our services, factoring in time when we're deliberately going to try and wait on the Holy Spirit. And it's a little bit awkward and it's a bit difficult because it's the bit when we're not in control. But if we want to be powered by the Holy Spirit, that's what we need to do. So let's look to the first followers of Jesus, these first Holy Spirit waiters, to learn a thing or two about how to wait well ourselves. So how to wait well for the power of the Holy Spirit. First, while we wait, we celebrate. At the end of Luke's gospel, which we've already had a quick glance at, after Jesus instructed his followers to stay in the city until you've been clothed with power from on high, he ascends into heaven, and what do his followers do? In Luke 24, verse 52, it says, they worshipped him and returned to Jerusalem with great joy, and they stayed continually at the temple, praising God. Worship, joy, praise. This is what waiting on God looked like for Jesus' first followers. Celebration. And it's not unique either. We're, we're not far out of Advent and Christmas, uh, and that's a time of waiting for God and anticipation. And just think about the characters that we meet during Advent and Christmas. Mary, Elizabeth, shepherds, Magi, Simeon, Anna. We catch them 
all at it. We catch them all celebrating, praising God, full of joy at the promises of God. They show us how it's done. This is the way to wait well. While we wait, we celebrate. And uh, for us, we can celebrate God in all kinds of ways. I guess the most basic way is setting your alarm clock on a Sunday morning and putting church as your default activity for Sunday, your regular time to praise. But um, you can build celebration into your daily life as well. Lots of people find listening to worship music really helpful. Just put on some worship music in your headphones on the way to work or in the car. Or make time for whatever else lifts your heart to God and lifts your eyes to God. Maybe it's painting, maybe it's running, maybe it's music, maybe it's silence. Do those things that help you praise God. Make time for them. Another way to celebrate day to day is to cultivate a habit of thankfulness. When you feel joyful about something, however small it is, deliberately notice it and seize the moment and say thank you to God. Remember his goodness. Or equally, when you feel low, when you're feeling really rubbish, take a moment to acknowledge objectively what Jesus has done for you. Perhaps just take a moment to picture him on the cross and say, thank you, Jesus, because you have died for me. You have died to take away my sins. That's celebration too, praising God in the hard times. You don't have to feel happy and joyful. We can celebrate God in the hard times too. Whatever it is, while we wait, we celebrate. Secondly, while we wait, we supplicate. Now, supplicate is just another word for pray, if you didn't know, by the way. Uh, But unfortunately, pray doesn't rhyme with wait. So I have chosen supplicate instead. While we wait, we supplicate. And verse 14 spells this out. It says, they all join together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. It seems that while Jesus' first followers waited for the promised power of the Holy Spirit, prayer was their basic activity. And just to go back to that apprenticeship analogy again, while waiting for the master's next lesson, the good apprentice doesn't just sit in the corner scrolling on their phone or looking out the window. They watch. They watch attentively. They listen They ask questions, they share problems, they talk with the master and build a rapport and build a relationship with him. Prayer is like this. Watching God, listening to God, talking with God. So that when the promised power of the Holy Spirit comes, we're ready and attentive. While we wait, we supplicate, we pray. And thirdly, while we wait, We congregate. Verse 14 again. They all join together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. Uh, The Greek word translated here as they all join together is homothumadon. And it means with one passion with one passion or with one mind. So literally, if you were to translate that verse literally, it would read, they were all with one passion praying constantly. Waiting on the Holy Spirit is like this. It's congregational. It's something we do together. We are multiple people, but our waiting is a shared passion. And that means we lean on each other. We listen to each other. And of course, at the most basic level, again, we congregate at church on a Sunday. We congregate physically. We come together. You can't be a Christian on your own. Because we're not each waiting on a different Holy Spirit who is going to give us all competing instructions. We're waiting on one Holy Spirit. We are the body of Christ. And we wait and we act as one with one passion, powered by one Holy Spirit. So while we wait, 
we congregate. So there are three little tips from Jesus' first followers to waiting well. While we wait, we celebrate. While we wait, we supplicate. While we wait, we congregate. This is what Jesus' first followers did, and this is how we wait well. Uh, And I think one thing that is really clear from their behavior in, in all three of those is this. We need to get over the widespread assumption of our racing-paced culture that waiting is bad, that waiting is dead time, that waiting is a waste of time. When you're waiting for the power of the Holy Spirit, it simply is not. It's not a waste of time. God has a purpose for us in our waiting. God has a purpose for us in our waiting. And we won't always see what that purpose is at the time. But I think the contours or like the rough shape of God's purposes for making us wait are shown in what we've already seen. Celebration, supplication, congregation. Through celebration, God teaches us to love him more. Through supplication, God teaches us to depend on him more. And through congregation, God teaches us to love our neighbor more. I'll just say that again. Through celebration, God teaches us to love him more. Through supplication, God teaches us to depend on him more. And through congregation, God teaches us to love our neighbor more. I believe those are God's purposes for making us wait. So that when the Holy Spirit does come on us, it will be powering not just any old people. It will be powering a people who are in love with God, dependent on him, and in love with each other. That's about all I have to say this morning about waiting on the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe it's the final agenda that Jesus left with, and I believe it should be our agenda always. But specifically, we've got a sense here at Ascension that this is the agenda for 2023. Um, And after all of that thought about waiting, we're not going to just rush on to the next thing now. We are going to have a bit of waiting, and I think Amanda's going to guide us through it. So let's wait together.